Hello beautifuls, welcome back to my channel. It has been one year since I have had facial feminization surgery. Isn't that right, Mr. Biscuits? A lot can change in a year, can't it? You weren't even here a year ago. No, I'll oh, big yawn. Big yawn for little biscuit. And today's video is going to be an update about all the experiences that I have had so far healing and recovering from facial feminization surgery. I come to you today with probably the lightest amount of makeup that I have worn on my YouTube channel for a very, very long time. <laughs> what? You want to hide? Is it time to hide? <laughs> Does feel a little bit weird to be on camera with like literally bit of foundation, bit of a lip, bit of some mascara, and that's about it. But I thought I would do this so that you can actually see what my face actually looks like without any like dramatic contouring or rearranging of my eye shape or any extreme false lashes, girl. A witch. For those of you wondering, this is basically what I look like at the gym. So about a week ago now, I posted an Instagram story. If you want to go follow me on Instagram, it is xxluxaria, asking you guys if you had any questions about my facial feminization journey. First of all, I want to say a massive thank you to the huge brilliant reception that my facial feminization documentary got when I released it uh, literally a year ago documenting my whole experience with the surgery, finding my surgeons, and also some amount of healing after the surgery itself. And also how it felt to actually fly to a different country with my best friend and have my life changed for the better. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the love and attention you guys gave that video. If you want to watch it, there will be a link in the description box below, or you can click the little card wherever it shows up on whichever side so first of all, I want to talk about where I currently am with my healing and how I am feeling about the results of the surgery. So as a quick recap, I had six procedures done in my facial feminization surgery, which took place on May 24th of 2022 in Marbella with facial team. So I had a forehead reconstruction, which was to flatten the bone of my forehead. And I also within that had my orbital rims trimmed down to open up the eye area. I had a brow lift, a rhinoplasty, and a chinplasty, and also a tracheal shave. Let me just tell you, I think the last little bit of my healing to go now is a little bit of my sensation up here is still a little bit, uh, what's the best way to explain it? Unacceptable! A little bit like crossed over, like there's still some unusual sensations I have up here. They have gotten so much better since after I had my surgery and I remember that was a particular point of like, ah, this is very unpleasant. I still also have a little bit of numbness in my chin, especially on this side, relating to like this tooth. And I think it's because of the nerve that runs along here, the mandible nerve, mandibular nerve, mandibular nerve that runs along here. Aside from that, everything is A-OK -okay and everything is healing quite nicely. Oh, that's nice. Since I've had my facial feminization surgery, I have actually also had a couple of top ups when it comes to filler. So for example, my cheekbones have been filled a little bit with half a mil on each side just to help bring out a little bit of shape here. And I've had my lips redone. My under eyes I've also had refilled. And I also had a little bit of chin filler because originally I wanted to have the little dimple in my chin like smoothed out and filled in. I actually don't really like the way that the chin filler is sitting in my face. So I'm actually going to get it dissolved. I actually prefer, weirdly enough saying this, didn't think I would say this ever in my life, that I actually prefer a softer, rounder chin as opposed to like the Bella Hadid jaw. Can you believe it? Trendsetter? I don't think so. That is the real thing, snatched. So my lovelies, I posted a story on Instagram asking you guys if you had any specific questions about my facial feminization process. So. Let's head over to Instagram and answer some, shall we? Ace Carter 2003 has asked, is there anything you regret or would change? So, I wouldn't say there's any regrets. I would say there is one thing that I would change. For me, when I first came out of surgery, my swelling was in a very contained state, should I say. I was quite swollen like in the center of my face, but I didn't really get much bruising or much like discoloration of skin, anything like that. However, when I first had my nose cast taken off, that was a point of me of like shock because I knew that the healing process was gonna happen. I knew not to think about my results until a years down the line, until literally around about now. When I first took that cast off or had the nurse take it off and I looked at my profile and my nose went down and then up ever so slightly because of the swelling, I had a little bit of like a, not a panic response, but a little bit of a response that was like, <gasps> 
I've been botched. Like there was a little bit of that, a little tiny bit of that. And I'm kind of annoyed at myself for thinking about that now, but that is, I can't change how I felt in the moment. That is exactly how I felt in the moment. But with the help of my friends and my boyfriend and just really understanding or telling myself repeatedly, this is the swelling, it's going to change. This is the swelling, it's going to change. This is the swelling, it's going to change. Tappa, tappa, tappa. That really helped keep my head in the game of just healing. That wasn't the final result, etc. I mean, my chin had swollen up a lot as well. But at that moment, I would say I didn't regret my nose, but I sort of regretted how my nose was looking at that time in that moment. And now I'm actually very pleased with how my profile looks. In terms of is there anything I would change, I actually don't think that my tracheal shave was as aggressive as it could have been. So there is a debate in the facial feminization surgical community about something known as the conservative approach. Now I know, you wouldn't usually find me saying, oh I was conservatively approached on my channel, but here we are. Oh, wow. scandalous. So I had conservative approach uh, surgery, which was basically we're moving things by millimeters, if that. And that was the most sensible way for me to approach approach my surgical expectations was I didn't want to look like a different person. I wanted to look like me, but softer. I will, however, say I probably could have gone for a more aggressive approach when it came to my tracheal shave, because although I didn't really have much of like a, a, a pronounced tracheus, tracheus, tracheal, What's it called? <laughs> trachea. I didn't have much of a pronounced trachea, colloquially known as an Adam's apple. I didn't have much of one and I still don't really have much of one. But I think now because everything else looks a bit softer, this is still particularly visible. I have my tiny scar. I don't know if you're even gonna ever be able to hear this. I have my tiny scar, where is it? Here, for my tracheal shave, here, like here. And, I very much was of the opinion when I approached my facial feminization surgery doctors that I was going to have vocal feminization surgery. And I actually also believe that facial team uh, collaborate with the voice specialist in South Korea. I think it's Yukon. I think it's the Yukon Surgical Center, I think. Not sure, don't quote me on that. So because I was planning on having voice feminization surgery, I think that actually changed the way that my surgeons approached my tracheal shave because there used to be a conversation about only being able to have one or the other done. So I think my tracheal shave was done in quite a conservative way so that any future operations that I had in my throat wouldn't be affected. I will say I probably wouldn't go for that now. I probably wouldn't go for my tracheal shave. I would get facial feminization surgery, wait until it's healed, then get my voice surgery, and then get a tracheal shave after that if I really needed it. So that's where I'm at in terms of would I change anything about my surgery experience. I do have a pretty big scar on the back of my head and I have a feeling that one side of my hairline on this side, I'll get some pictures in for you, has a little bit more dramatic uh, hair loss than I would like to have seen. I mean, the scarring itself has healed really, really well, but I do feel like there's a lot of hair missing in that area. So I feel like when I have my next uh, hair transplant, which is another thing that I want to talk about later on, that I might see if there's any chance I can have just like that area filled in a little bit. There are so many questions in here about my clothes and Eurovision. How funny is that? So the next question that we have is by Sophia Spooky Stuff. And they ask, how are you feeling? Are the results everything you hoped for? And I will say at this point, I still got a little tiny bit of healing to go. I feel like I have a little tiny bit of swelling in my my nose still. I can't really pull my lip down very much, but I can't remember if I could do that before this surgery anyway. But I am so unbelievably happy with how my results have turned out. This is exactly what I wanted. I love the fact that my eyes are a lot more open. You can actually see my eyelids. My eyebrows are in a gorgeous position. I'm very pleased with my brow lift. The only thing that I have a small, is it concern? I'm not sure if the word is concern. Uh, Issue with, I guess I do have an issue with this because this is why I'm talking about it. Oh, let's go. So because I have my bone removed here and my hairline pulled back to uh, stitch the, the 
Brett's incision together at the back of my head. I feel like my forehead is bigger than it was when I, before the surgery. I haven't done any measurements of before and after and that's what's really annoying. I kind of wish I had measured the distance between my brow and my hairline because I now look at my face and I see a big round forehead and I never saw that before. So I think either the fact that my features are now smaller makes everything else look bigger, like the my cheeks look huge now in comparison to the rest of my face, as does my forehead here. So I am considering getting just a top up hair transplant just to like round off a little bit of my hairline to make it about maybe half a centimeter a centimeter shorter just so that my forehead I feel a lot happier with it so when I wear my hair up like this I don't feel like I'm particularly worried about people thinking oh my god what a large forehead that woman has is there anything else we should know about her oh my god bathroom ban let's not even go there shall we let's not even go there so overall i will actually say that i am very very pleased with how my facial feminization surgery results are healing and going. I just can't wait for the last little bit of swelling in my nose to go down. I also, if you notice, have a tiny little bit of swelling left here in the side like cartilage part of the nose, but that has dramatically reduced in I would say like the last three months or so. So I'm hoping that over the next sort of six months, it will be completely gone. Samantha G 91 X asks, having rhinoplasty and breast augmentation in July, any tips for recovery? Yes, do not judge the book by its cover girls. So I would say basically try and reassure yourself that the immediate results you see are not necessarily the ones that you're going to have long term. So as I mentioned earlier, the swelling on the tip of my nose kind of threw me for a loop a little bit because I felt like it kind of made me look a little bit like a cartoon bat. I felt like because my chin was so big and my nose was so upturned, it was very like Mona the Vampire vibes. I don't know. I just kept looking in the mirror and being like, I sort of hate that and I can't wait for that to change. And I tried desperately to kind of like tread water mentally to be like, if I think about this too much, it's going to consume my life and I'm going to get very upset because I'm full of anesthetic and I'm going through it, girls. It's mentally draining. She's dead. So I would say, make sure you surround yourself with a really, really good support network of people that are just understanding of what you're going through because you're probably gonna want to rant to someone about a bit of swelling or about a bit of bruising or something. And you need someone there who's just gonna listen and not be like nah, bah, bah, bah. like you just want to rant so yeah get yourself a nice little friend that you can rant to aside from that i will actually say the recovery from breast surgery which is what i had done in november is actually probably more annoying than the face uh recovery because this having this all like tight kind of affects like your arm movements and then that affects just like how much you can actually do in your day-to-day -day life which is more annoying than anything else next up we have amy the youtube addict one one eleven girls what other plastic surgery procedures are you thinking of getting so i've kind of touched on two of them in uh this video already so far i am very much near the end of my list of procedures that i wanted in my feminization journey i really am near the near the very end and if it wasn't for my channel like blowing up over 2020 I would never have imagined that I would be this close to it it's actually quite surprising really and it actually makes me feel so much nicer to think that like I know that it's very from a point of privilege for me to say that I'm nearing the end of my <laughs> my, my journey so to speak oh god how dark and mysterious naughty mummy there are two things that I would really like to have one of them I would consider cosmetic and one of them I would consider uh, part of my transition journey. So the hairline transplant that I mentioned earlier is probably not necessarily part of like my transition journey. That's purely cosmetic from a point of like, I don't feel like having a larger forehead affects my femininity, but it does affect the way that I see my body, which is a different issue to gender dysphoria. However, I will say my voice. My voice is still the one thing in my life that kind of makes me quite dysphoric. On phones, in video, on audio, I am constantly aware of my voice. And a lot of people do tell me that I have a voice that's like considerably considerably feminine. I mean, the way that I speak is quite feminine. When I when you look at it from like a scientific point of view of like the 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 hertz of a female voice versus a male voice and the androgynous range, my voice is firmly in the androgynous range. Quite often I will get gendered correctly and then quite often I will get misgendered as well. So it's a little bit of swings and roundabouts and it's one of those things in my life that I would not have to think about anymore. I can quite happily leave my house without any makeup on, 
wear less makeup in my videos, wear less makeup in my day-to-day -day life, and wear my hair in a really disgusting, like, ratty ponytail if I wanted to, and I would still be gendered uh, correctly as long as I don't open my mouth. When I open my mouth, sometimes I see that little glaze on people's faces that kind of go like, hmm, and I'm like, oh. This is the one thing that causes me a lot of like dysphoria because it makes me not want to speak. And I feel like having a voice is such an important part of life. So my next surgery, I don't know when it's gonna happen. I'm, I'm in the beginnings of like organizing it now will be my voice, my vocal feminization surgery. Likely going to have a glottoplasty, but I'm also going to assess my other options and what's available. I don't want to have my voice changed so dramatically that I don't recognize myself when I speak, but I also want to have a marked improvement on the way that I sound to myself. It's a, it's, it's gonna be a learning curve, I think, because with the voice surgery, it's a little a bit more unpredictable than something like a nose job or a chin plasty or something like that. So it's definitely something I need to think about a lot more. I need to consider my options. I also need to consult with more than one doctor, although one of the best doctors for it in the world happens to live in London, literally a 20 minute tube ride from me. So I'm going to book in with them first and just really listen to what is available for me. When I first started my transition process, I used to put on a much deeper voice than I had. Um, and that was, I guess that was an aspect of masking, really. I'll put in maybe a clip if I'm not absolutely dying of cringe in the editing room. So this is how my voice started pre-transition. I wanted to kind of represent what I used to be when I was much younger. And now this is how my voice sounds post-transition, if you like, even though I'm kind of near the end of post-transition. So there is an improvement. I have done years of vocal therapy, voice training to try and really unlock the potential of my voice. I just feel like it needs a little bit of like mechanical help or something else to just get it to the ballpark of where I would like it to be. It's not, never going to be perfect. I don't think that any of my surgeries are ever going to be 100% perfect. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for improvement, not perfection. Because if you constantly search for perfection, you will never find it. And what does that lead to? Greater disappointment. Is that tea? Next up, we have a question by Makey Zonderhuer. I think that's how you say your name. Sorry, lovely. And they ask, what makes you the happiest looking in the mirror now? So my facial feminization surgery was a collaboration in my mind between alleviating gender dysphoria and supplying myself with happiness. So between those two things, I actually love looking in the mirror and seeing just how like, wide and open and like bright and lovely my eyes look now. It's the most invasive part of facial feminization surgery, the orbital and brow bone like reduction because I previously had a very strong brow bone. I actually really like weirdly liked the intensity that it gave me, but looking back on it now, I keep looking back at pictures and I'm like, what a severe face I have. She's so severe, that girl is so severe. And now I'm a lot more softer. But in a way, it's kind of taken my edge a little bit. And I did actually have a bit of a moment of like, I don't look as edgy as I used to. And I also wonder if maybe that's also because I don't have my like septum ring in, which I really want to get done again once my nose swelling is finished and done with itself. Loved my septum ring. But also the like shadow intense drama of a brow bone with a flat brow was just so... I don't know, it was my face for a very long time, so I was very used to it and very used to doing makeup in a specific way that accentuated that. Now that I have a very soft eye shape, it's a, I still have deep set eyes and I've still got quite a dramatic brow, but my, you can see my eyelid, you can see my eyes are a lot more open. I look a lot more happy and less edgy. And that is something that I'm now over. But when I first, when I first noticed this in the mirror, I was like, oh my goodness. Have I lost my edge? Who is she? She's gone from severe CEO to like, whimsical lady in the garden. <laughs> Deranged. And I did have a little bit of like a, oh no, what if I'm not goth anymore? Uh, like an absolute like ridiculous woman, but there we go. That was something that I found interesting to have to deal with. But I would say that looking in the mirror right now, one of my favorite features on my face that brings me the most happiness is my eyes. Savvy Panther has asked, did it make you more confident and make you feel more like yourself? Oh, this is a juicy question. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the concept of feeling like yourself? For me, short answer, yes. Long answer, what is the self? 
are you prepared to watch a ContraPoints video? <laughs> no, as if I have a shred of her talent. Did it make me feel more like myself? In a strange way, yes, it did. But in a way that's like, it actually made me feel a lot happier to show myself off, if this makes sense. So previously I would find it very difficult without makeup on or without like uh, an aspect of like feminizing myself daily in quite a like dramatic way in order to like pop to my local shop if I needed to get some like small amount of groceries or if I wanted to go to the gym. I felt like I had to do like almost a full face of makeup to go to the gym in order to feel like I would pass a lot better. After having facial feminization surgery and after the swelling has gone down, I feel a lot more confident in just waking up and existing. And that is the exact amount of alleviation of gender dysphoria that was necessary for me. This wasn't like a beautifying process, although I'm very happy that a lot of the decisions that I made to get also led me to a nice, beautiful outcome. I'm also very, very, very pleased with the outcome in terms of results of just feeling a lot happier. Being able to wake up and not even consider thinking, oh my God, I need to do like an hour of makeup just to even leave the house. If I have to wake up at seven to make sure that I get to supermarket by eight, but and then leave to go to work at nine, but then I, I also need to wake up and put on loads of makeup to in order to complete this. Like it just dismantled that idea and I just feel a lot more calm and stress-free. Like it's a less, less of a process for me to get ready. It's less of a process for me to have to mentally prepare myself to go through the day and deal with people. Beforehand, I wouldn't want people to see me without like a very specific feminine style makeup that I would do because that's how I felt like I should present to the world. I don't feel like I have to do that as much now. And I feel like that a level of that dysphoria will be alleviated again once I have my voice done. The idea that I could just go outside, no makeup on, and speak to someone and just feel so fine and normal is like really alluring to me. That's such a like beautiful concept and I cannot wait to fully experience that. And I feel like my voice is like the last key to that lock. So I don't think it made me feel more confident, but it made me feel more confident with myself, I think. Does that make sense? No. It's like a bit of yes with an asterisk of like, what is the self? Uh. <laughs> Traxus Pundler has asked, what is the best and worst part of the experience? Wow, we girls, wow, we. So, oh, the best part was probably uh, just how good Facial Team are as like a, uh, uh, a surgical center, I guess. They are so attentive, so loving and welcoming and just really lovely people. Like at no point did I feel like I was being sold on something or I felt like I was having a like a bad experience or even like I wasn't being listened to or something like that. It's like every one of my decisions was I was being spoken like very clearly about. There was even a moment where I was even like talking about my uh, chin plasty and like the results that I wanted from it. And they invited me again in to have a, like a, another conversation about it. So they weren't just like, oh, you know, yeah, that's what you're getting. Everyone gets the same, blah, blah. Like I felt very listened to. And so that to me was a really good part of the experience. Also the fact that I was able to leave the UK, London, the UK, fly to Marbella and have some of the top surgeons in the world in facial feminization surgery working on me was just like, that as an experience, as someone who like grew up in very humble beginnings, who had a little bit of like an effed up family, didn't really feel like I fit in a lot of places, struggled with my identity, struggled with making money, struggled with surviving, and then being able to go through a procedure, a process like that to help my quality of life by some of the best people in the world is a huge realization for me in a way that's like, this is actually my life now. Like quite often I stop at the moment and I'm like, I've just, I have actually had like a major surgery that has drastically improved the quality of my life. And it, that is wild to me. So that to me is like the best, best part of the experience. Worst part of the experience I would probably say is immediately coming out of surgery and waking up from anesthesia. Wow, that is hateful. I remember they have to put this like cold compressed mask on your face in order to help with swelling. I would have much rather have allowed my swelling to just go wild, like get my swelling go wild if it meant I didn't have to wear this. This thing that like went over my lips and it just felt like very unpleasant thing like pressing on my face and after having lots of surgery and stuff I just wanted to feel a bit free so that was like a very difficult moment of the surgical healing process there was also a moment that I was in my ward and it was late at night and I was by myself and 
it was the day after surgery. And I remember just sort of like briefly looking over to my right and looking out of my window and thinking, I'm the loneliest person in the world. I'm so sad. Like looking back at it now, it's hilarious. And so, so utterly ludicrous because quite obviously that's not the case. But at the time coming out of anesthetic, waking up full of absolute, like all sorts of painkillers and drugs and my system being cleared out. I haven't even been able to eat anything properly yet. I've got this thing on my face that's freezing me. It's late at night. I am by myself. Like there was loads of these things. And I, I remember just that moment of like, uh, and I think that was like the worst part of the experience. But then the next day and the day after that, it just got better and better and better and better. And I managed to have a nice sunny little vacation in Marbella at the same time with my bestie Roly. So it was a lovely experience all round. Next we have Sina Epona girls and they ask, what does it feel like seeing clips of your face before? I.e. in the funny clips you add in your new videos. So this is a very strange one because I will sometimes use a clip, especially this one. I'm oh, cracked the code, oh, girl. Oh, she's got a degree. The rumors are true. She does, in fact, have a degree. I look at it and I'm like, who, who is that? Who is, who is that? Because although clearly I'm the same person, I look very similar, just things are a bit softer. I feel like a very different person then. And I think that's not just like having the surgery, but also like going through the transformative process of the surgery full stop. I think is actually a huge experience to have. I mean, also it's like a video that's a couple of years old now. So naturally the progression of your like development as a human happens as well, but it is a bit jarring, I must admit. And there's even a clip, the clip of the America's Next Top Model and America's Next Top Scandal Girls little like video clip that I make, this one. <laughs> where I'm still really healing and you can kind of still see that like pointed upturned nose thing that I was talking about that kind of makes me feel like I looked a bit like a cartoon bat. To look back at these old clips, I don't feel like I'm overwhelmingly like hateful about them. I'm just also a little bit like, oh, a little bit like, wow, I forgot about all that. I forgot, you know? It's a bit of a strange one, but I don't mind it so much. Bit of a strange one. Nicole de Moran asks, as painful as surgery is, how bad was the aftercare? Wow. Okay, so aftercare. Let's talk about aftercare, shall we, my lovelies? Post-surgery healing, because I went through it. So I very much was an active, fit, healthy person. I paid attention to my diet and I paid attention to my workouts. I did uh, daily walks and I did daily kettlebell workouts, or maybe not every day, maybe more like every other day. Kettlebell workouts to try and get my body in as physical fit shape as possible for my facial feminization surgery. I managed to hit my goal weight. I feel like I looked lovely and I felt very healthy. After having my facial feminization surgery, I was told six weeks until you can go back in the gym. I waited eight weeks just to be sure. And I felt okay. I want to say that I felt okay. But I would find that I kept getting dizzy and fainting in the gym. And that was so frustrating because that fully put a wall between like my mental recovery of getting back to my healthy body and also therefore accepting my new face with my fit and healthy body, that kind of a thing. So it was actually really annoying that I couldn't do more than like an eight minute workout before my body was like, we're gonna faint, we're gonna faint, we're gonna feel very sick, we're gonna faint. And I've, I've not been a fainter before. It has happened to me once or twice, but it's never been like every workout, every time. And this happened constantly. It happened three times and then I was like, do you know what? I'm just gonna take another month off the gym. Because of all that, my diet went to crap. And that's when I also decided that in the last stages of healing from facial feminization surgery, I wanted to get my breasts uh, enlarged. So I went and asked my surgical advisor if it was okay to do so. And they said, yes, it's absolutely fine. So I then went ahead and had my breasts done. And I had the same problem again in January when I had recovered and I could go back to the gym. I felt very faint again. And I actually think it's a thing that I have with anesthetic. I think there's just... Because I have to have a lot more anesthetic than a lot of other people. I think I have, I think I have a slight ginger gene, that ginger gene, that redhead gene, that means you need to have more anesthetic than uh, people that don't have the gene. I'm sure I have that somewhere in my body, somewhere. Because sometimes, weirdly enough, anesthetic has like strange long lasting effects. And I have said to myself now, it's nearly, it's a year from my FFS, but it's been six months since I've had my breasts done. I'm now going to start going back 
to the gym and paying attention to my diet and trying to get myself back to where I feel more confident. So I would say the aftercare is probably the strangest experience for me so far. A swelling is a swelling is a swelling. It will go down by itself. There's not really a lot you can do apart from wearing your headband or your compression garments and like using the creams that everyone tells you to use. Apart from that, it's time. And so I felt a little bit impatient when I realized that I couldn't just jump back in the gym and get back to it like some of my other sisters have been able to after getting facial feminization surgery. So that to me has been a little bit of a mental struggle because it's actually had like a detrimental effect on the way that my body looks. And so now I don't feel gender dysphoric really with my body, but I do feel a bit like, oh, I'm not in the shape I want to be. I will also say though that on this side of my head, I don't know why on this side in particular, the sensation and like the nerves rebonding to, I don't know, the flat piece of scalp or the flesh, you know, reattaching itself to my cranium has somehow like crossed a nerve wire because if I touch here, I can feel it here. Whereas on this side, I can feel my head wherever I touch it. But on this side, if I touch in my hairline, it feels like I'm tickling here. And that is a very strange experience. And I actually had like a few shooting pains every now and then from this part of my head. And I think it's because when they cut the back of your head and they peel it forward and they remove the bone and then it reattaches gently, I think maybe just this side is gonna take a little bit longer to get its sensation back. At first, that was very uncomfortable. Now it's just mildly uncomfortable. And unless I really think about it, it doesn't really freak me out. So yeah, the aftercare is probably the longest part. Let's be honest, it's probably the longest part. Uh, Mr. Chris Shater asks, have you had any negative experiences from the public relating to your surgeries? This is a bit of a weird question because a single instance does not immediately pop up to my mind, but there was definitely a, a consensus from a certain group of people. And I think they did have my best interest in heart of saying like, why are you getting this done? You don't need this done. Like, it seems a bit excessive to have this done. But now afterwards, I think a lot of people are like, oh my God, no, I totally see why you wanted it done. I totally see how you've gone through the process and blah, 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 blah. The public at large have not like, the public at large, like I'm some famous woman. Budget cuts. The public at large haven't really had like a negative response to me. I have had a couple of questions from people who maybe don't know me well enough to know that I'm going through like a trans journey and they've sort of gone, have you, have you got something different about you? And it's like, oh yeah, I had a nose job or something like that. I just say, I say something very simple and understandable to like the majority of people. Like people can understand a nose job. If I start talking about facial feminization surgery, people don't necessarily know what that means or what that entails. So if I start saying things like, well, I had, I had a chin plasty and I had a type three forehead reconstruction. Or is it time four? I always forget this. Or my orbital rims shaved. Like they're not really, they might not necessarily understand that. So I just say like, oh yeah, I had a nose job. And it's a lot more understanding. So I need to actually update my passport photo because uh, I recently came back from Malta and <laughs> someone was like, did you look a little bit different from your passport? And I was just like, yeah, I had a nose job. So not necessarily negative experiences, but definitely it's opened up a platform of questioning, I would say. But I'm also very open with my journey. Like you can go on my Instagram. In my day-to-day -day life, I live quite stealth. And that's just me naturally falling into that route. But online, I don't consider myself stealth at all. I'll put trans joy, transgender, transsexual on things. And I'm very happy for people to know that I am trans. And I think that actually, maybe not helped, but I think that also softens the public's negative response to like surgery or something like that, because I feel like people understand a lot more generally, although let's not talk about that loud minority at the moment, very loud, loud minority of people being like, trans people are scum. I feel like most people are quite understanding when they are explained things to. And through my online life is where I like to do that and not necessarily face to face. <laughs> Ruthie94 has asked, how long did it take you to decide on where to go? And let me tell you, this took me a long time. It took me years to decide where to go to. So up until very recently, there was two major surgical centers that you would go to in Europe if you wanted facial feminization surgery. Uh, there are some in the UK. There's actually two in the UK now. There's Dr. James Inglefield in London, and there's also someone in Brighton. His name escapes me, but he does facial feminization surgery in Brighton as well. Weirdly enough, I grew up there, never heard about him. And But you don't hear a lot about his work. I don't know why, you just don't. There was another surgical center in Belgium that I did in fact um, consult with at first and I had a very negative experience with them and this was back in 2016. 
very negative. In fact, it was so negative to the point that I thought, oh, maybe facial feminization isn't for me at all. It wasn't until several years later that I actually had a, uh, a, a consultation with facial team. And that's when I decided, oh my goodness, no, it wasn't me at all. It was them. And this is a wonderful experience. One of the reasons I actually decided to go with facial team is because they had actually done facial feminization surgery on my best friend, Sinestra, when she was with us. And her results were absolutely gorgeous. So I always knew of them. I just knew that they were a little bit more premium in their prices, but they also give a much safer result that's more stable in the long term. So it's definitely something to consider. And I think anyone going for any surgery, you should always consult way more than just one surgical center or one surgeon, just for your own peace of mind. And also just to understand maybe what is what is even available to you. So I knew what I wanted, almost, almost a blessing in disguise. I knew what I actually wanted more because of that negative experience with one of the other FFS surgeons, shall we say. I knew more about what I did want from that negative experience. And I took that negative experience forwards and actually had more questions to ask in a more positive, well-rounded way. And Facial Tea managed to give me absolutely everything and all the results that I would want. The last question we have is by this very unusual woman called Olympia Avalanche. I don't know how I'm gonna tell my family and my friend. And they have asked me, do you believe that the FFS contributed greatly to serving Kane at the Trier Haas? Yes, I do believe that. In fact, <laughs> I do definitely feel a lot more pussy at the pageant from having facial feminization surgery. I know the point is not to feel more beautiful, but I absolutely do. So thank you so much, Olympia. But I am actually going to end this video on the note that it is an expensive, lengthy process to go through. I saved up for years and years and years. And because of my success in 2020, I was able to pull my surgery forward by a, a few years. So I'm very, very thankful to everyone here who has supported me through Patreon, who has supported the channel through liking, subscribing, and commenting. You guys have absolutely changed my life beyond measure and recognition. And I think it's just wonderful. It's just, wow, aren't you lovely? It's just wonderful. Oh, that's nice. And with that being said, my loves, I want to thank everyone who supported me here on the Chanel through Patreon, through channel memberships, through being here in the live streams, through supporting me on Twitch, my lovelies. And you know what? With that, I'll see you in the next video. Oh, a big yawn from Mr. Biscuits. You don't care if I had a big, strong brow bone, do you? Although you never saw me with my old face.